as our own beloved Reverend John will be bringing us a message this morning, a message of light, a message of love, and a message of excitement and celebration. Please help me welcome Reverend John. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Good morning, my beloved friends and family. Joy for me to add my own words of welcome on this beautiful Christmas Sunday and to say, the Christ in me truly beholds the Christ in you. And I touch the feet of my very beloved Dr. Elma Lumsden, a great teacher, a great way show herself, a person who embodies the consciousness of this teaching and has, has lived it all her life. Can we just give her a big round of applause? And to our friends on the World Wide Web who listen to us, we say there might have been no room in the inn that night so long ago, but there's room in our hearts for you. Thank you for joining us in consciousness. I want to begin with a story, and it's a true story. And the children are going to have to help me. So Harrison, um, just listen up. <laughs> and where is Chevenet? Don't move, just listen up. I want you to help me. What do you want for Christmas? The father asked his daughter. She wrinkled her nose and scrunched her eyes and thought, hmm, do you want a doll? No, daddy. A, a, a tea set? No. What about a pony? No, daddy. I have to think. I want this year to be a special year, a year to remember. All right, you think and let me know, love. Ellen thought. Children, what do you think Ellen might have wanted? Harrison, what do you think Ellen might have wanted? Um, a football. No? A baseball. A baseball. Uh, Chevrolet, what do you think Ellen might have wanted for Christmas? A Samsung or a book. Yes, good. You always want books. Well, Ellen thought. She thought of bonbons and chocolates and new dresses and hats. And it was a long time ago, so she thought about kid boots and books and gloves and lace collars. But none of these were what she wanted. What would be special? Each day her father asked her, Ellen, do you know what you want for Christmas yet? And Ellen would shake her head and say, no, father, I'm still thinking. After four days, her dad said, Ellen, yes, father, I've decided. Well, I have a riddle. It will tell you what gift I want for Christmas. And the riddle is this. Listen up, kids, I want you, want you to remember the riddle. You cannot buy it, for it is worth all the money you have but only you can give it. Sharon, can we say that together? You cannot buy it, for it is worth all the money you have, but only you can give it. Everybody, help them with it for me, please. You cannot buy it, for it is worth all the money you have, but only you can give it. I cannot buy it, Dad thought, because it is worth all the money I have, but only I can give it. Is that right? Yes, Father. Well, now it is my turn to think about your riddle. I have to find the perfect present in this mystery that you have told me. Her father paced and wondered, and he repeated the riddle over and over again. Uh, can you remember what the riddle is? You cannot, you cannot buy it, for it is worth all the money you have but only you can give it. He paced and pondered, and finally he smiled. I know what it is. I know what it is. Now he had to think how to give it. What's he going to give her, you think, Harrison? Love. Love, wow, wow. Well, I have a whole megaton of that for you. Give him that. <laughs> Chevrolet, what do you think? Love too, wow. I have a megaton of that for you too. 
Under the Christmas tree on Christmas morning, there was no present from her father, and Ellen didn't expect one. After the presents were opened, Ellen's father said, it is now time for Ellen's present from me. Ellen, come sit here with me. So Ellen climbed into the armchair and sat on her daddy's lap. My present to you, my precious, is very special. I hope it is what you wanted, for it is not a book or a toy or clothes. But instead, it is a present that is for all seasons and for each day. This year, your Christmas present from me is that we will spend time together every week, just the two of us. For you are my very special daughter, and I love you dearly. Ellen hugged her father and said, Oh, Daddy, I knew you would figure out the riddle. And her father said, You cannot buy it. Remind me, children, what, what the riddle is. You cannot buy it, for it is worth all the money you have, but only you can give it. And so the dad said, It took me a long time to figure out the answer, but when I did, I knew what gift you wanted. The answer is simple. Give yourself. Oh, Father, I wanted a gift to make this year special. Time together with you will make this year the very best year of my whole life. Ellen looked into her father's eyes and suddenly she said, Why, Father, you're crying. Yes, child. You teach me more than any book I've ever read or written. By giving you time, I will gain much more than I give. So it was Ellen's turn to figure out this riddle. How could her father, by spending time with her, get more than he gave? She thought she knew. For love, you're quite right, Harrison and Chevenet, love multiplies. It grows and grows. But perhaps she would only understand this when she was older and when she had children of her own. But her daddy understood. And when he wrote an essay on giving, he wrote, and I quote, give yourself, unquote. For he knew the wonder of this gift. And that daddy was Ralph Waldo Emerson, who learned the gift of giving from his daughter, Ellen Tucker Emerson. And so friends, I've titled my talk, My Christmas Encouragement, You Are the Gift. Can you just turn to your neighbor and say, you are the gift. You are the gift. I said neighbor, not the whole church. But you know, friends, I learned early in life how important the gift of self really is and how important it is to remove the various masks we wear to reveal our true spiritual identity. For you see, when I was a very little boy, I used to be terrified of the masqueraded bands that roamed the streets at Christmas time, dancing to the haunting music of fife and drum. They were called John Canoe, and I only had to hear the fifes in the distance to find the nearest cupboard to hide in. Now tell the truth, how many of you remember John Canoe? How many of you were frightened? Yes, Maestro, me too. <laughs> well, one Christmas um, time, they danced up the street on which we lived, and before I could bolt under the bed or into a closet, my dad, who we called Big John, took my hand firmly and said, and I quote, son, you have to conquer your fear. Fear, he said, is one of the most destructive emotions, and if you allow it, it can paralyze you so completely that it prevents you from functioning normally. So hold my hand, and let's go to the gate and watch. And remember, behind those masks are people just like you and me. As we walked to our gate, I kept remembering and reminding myself that my father was with me, and I was safe. So let's affirm, my father is with me and I am safe. Together, my father is with me and I am safe. But I got to tell you, even though John Kunibans are not as plentiful anymore, 
I still feel that trembling in the pit of my stomach whenever I hear someone playing a fife. It, it just makes me go, <clears throat> you know, it brings back that visceral memory. Um, it, I'm so sorry that the, the tradition is um, dwindling, but there is a group, in fact there are a couple of groups who are trying to keep it alive um, in, in our experience. So, the John Canoe, when we heard the fives, the cry would go out, John Canoe, come, John Canoe, come, children, let me hear you say, John Canoe, come, John Canoe, come, everybody, shout, John Canoe, come, John Canoe, come. It meant excitement was near, and people poured out of their houses, lining the streets to watch the dancing masqueraders. Children of all ages, and even some adults, maestro, would often run away screaming, frightened by the painted sieves worn as masks, and the occasional jabs from the devil's walk. Remember the devil? Yeah. And there was a belly woman, pregnant, and she would dance up into your face. I was terrified. <laughs> John Kunua come! John Kunua come! Friends, 
John Canoe is, is an example of creolization in action, or what the late Professor Rex Nettleford called the blending of the rhythm of Africa with the melody of Europe. It melded the tradition of masquerade from Africa with those of European masquerade and British miming plays. The traditional set of characters included the horned cow head, a policeman, horse head, wild Indian belly woman, a bride, house head, and of course the devil. But my favorite character was Pitchy Patchy. Give him some music. Music, music for Pitchy Patchy. <laughs> Give him some music. Pitchy Patchy might well be a metaphor for how many of us live our lives. In Jamaican Patois, when we say something Pitchy Patchy, we mean it's slipshod and incomplete. You look incomplete to you? <laughs> Sounds familiar to you though? You may start a project of, or a course of study or even begin a relationship, but we get distracted or sidetracked halfway through and begin something else or pursue yet another relationship. At the end of the day, you find you have a host of unfinished projects. And no wonder we sometimes end the year feeling ragged, as though our life is in tatters. So let us learn from Pitchy Patchy this Christmas to dance full out, but to finish what we start, especially when we have made a commitment, for promises are sacred. And when we were promised the Christ, we were given the Christ. So that is the lesson that perhaps we can learn from this colorful character. And then I used to love Belly Woman with her antics and exaggerated, often Lou gyrations. Give me some Belly Woman music. <laughs> Aha! This character, usually played by a man in the, in the tradition of the dame in British pantomime, Belly Woman symbolizes the bright promise of human potential. As you prepare to wind up 2013, this is perhaps a good time to begin thinking about what ideas are waiting to be born through you. This is a powerful message of Christmas, my friends. The tender story of the newborn baby bringing hope and joy, it is really your story. And the universe still sings with joy when you give birth to the gifts that you have brought to share with life. Then there is Cowhead. <laughs> You know what I mean, I say? The cowhead represents a stubborn part of my little self. How often spirit gives us a clear direction to do or not do something. Our intuition, which is the inside intuition or still small voice of our source, always guiding us, never wrong, always directing us. But what happened? We two, what we call in Jamaica, own away. You know own away? You know spirit telling you the right thing and you're saying, no matter can't bother with that, you As my grandmother used to say, make yourself stubborn, why? Hard is, I go kill you. Yeah. And so, in the middle of this John Connor celebration, I have an assignment. <laughs> you think you was going to escape? <laughs> Your assignment for the closing days of 2013, should you decide to undertake it, is to spend some quiet time this week just become still, take a few deep centering breaths, and then ask yourself this question. 
as the year comes to a close, what do I need to let go of so that I can grasp the new possibilities of 2014? And I want you to be honest with yourself. Is there anything that you are stubbornly holding on to? Old resentments or hurts? Let them go. Mistakes that you made that you need to forgive? Let them go. The apparent pitchy patchy state of your life and your bank account? Let it go. <laughs> Don't be a cowhead. Let go of what no longer serves you. And so let's all really repeat together, and I want the John, John Kunda band to do so too. I release and I let go. I let spirit guide my life. Together. I release and I let go. And I let spirit guide my life. Wow. Let spirit guide your life so that you can embody, embrace, and enjoy the abundant prosperity represented by Jack of the Green. Give him some music. Thank you, Jack of the Green. Originally a feature of English May Day celebrations, this was a, originally a foliage-covered character promising a rich harvest of whatever we plant. One simply can't plant corn and expect to reap gungu peas, can one? As it is with the physical laws of the universe, so it is, my friends, with the spiritual laws. So let us ensure this Christmas that we are planting the seeds of peace on earth and goodwill to all, which the angels sang, and which we all desire. And then there is the house, the house head. Metaphysically, come over here, sir. <laughs> come, sir. <laughs> Metaphysically, a house represents what? Our consciousness. When the master teacher and way shower Jesus said, In my father's house are many mansions, he was indicating that there are many levels of consciousness. Many of us, like Jesus, were born in humble circumstances. But Jesus proved that we need not be constrained by our origins. None of us need remain in this table of lack, limitation, and poverty. We are members, my friends, of the royal household of God. And you know, too many people are either still in this table or if they are ventured into the great house, they content themselves with living in the basement, which is often dimly lit and sparsely furnished. You use it for, for stack up things. We are born for greatness, and we deserve to live in the upper rooms, which are airy and filled with light. But to do so, we must first cast off our John Kuna masks and awaken to our spiritual magnificence. Jesus himself assures us in John 10, 34, and I quote, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods. Just think about that. The master himself said that it is written that we are ourselves God kind. And so Jesus discovered his own unique relationship with the infinite. And in so doing, he discovered his divinity. He discovered how to tap into the inexhaustible, limitless mind of God to find renewed creativity, a profusion of powerful ideas, 
and a perception into reality that way surpassed the comprehension of the Adam consciousness that believes in duality. In this church, we don't believe in duality. We believe in one God. Can we say that? One God. His message was simply that what God has done, God can do. That what was true of him must be potentially true of all mankind. And so my friends, if you really believe that you are created in the image and likeness of God, if you really believe that God is the only presence and the only power, then you must believe with me that there cannot, cannot be two powers, God and not God. For God is one, and therefore there can be no devil. <laughs>
And Mother Teresa said, Carmen Clark sent this to me, she sends out a daily affirmation, which is just wonderful, a daily inspiration. And this one said from Mother Teresa, I quote, it is Christmas every time you let God love others through you. And you know, if God is loving others through you and you've exited them, you can't withdraw your speech. Yes, we hurt each other sometime in, the, in the, the whole course of our journey through life. Let it go. Let it go and just let God love your fellow man and woman through you. Let's make that our gift to the world so that every day will be Christmas. For my friends, believe me, you and you and you and you, you are the gift. Namaste.